guardian of the United Nations North Atlantic Lifeline. 1,800 air miles from Halifax, 825 miles from Scotland, and only 900 from Nazi-held Norway. To this subarctic island during the summer of 1941 came the vanguard of an American expeditionary force. This film depicts Iceland as it looked between November 1941 and early spring 1942. Protected by a long spit of land, forming a natural breakwater, is the outer harbor of Reykjavik, Iceland's principal city. The airport. The city. outer and inner harbors. Because of limited docking facilities and the lack of deep water piers capable of accommodating the larger ships, the discharge of cargo is delayed for weeks at a time. In many cases, ships are compelled to wait in the outer harbor as long as seven weeks, and in some instances, are ordered home fully laden. Added to this is the problem of the tide. During low tide, Deep draft merchantmen like the Delta are obliged to leave the pier and await the return of high water. Many others are unloaded by tank lighters. This entire congested area offers a highly vulnerable target for attack. Since the port at Reykjavik is the only port in Iceland, all supplies and materials must be distributed throughout the island by trucks traveling over spongy, unimproved, one-way winding roads and over narrow country bridges. The United States Army is laying better road beds and is widening and strengthening the bridges to permit the passage of heavier trucks and tanks. The ice-free fjords, Qualfjord and Eigefjord, if extensively developed, could serve as auxiliary ports and relieve the unloading and distributing problem that now confronts our armed forces in the island. The naval air station in Skiri Fjord, showing the bomber squadron. Construction of the prefabricated Quonset huts proceeded rapidly despite the lack of tools needed to erect them. Sections of tongue and groove wood flooring form the foundation upon which a framework of curved angle irons are set. The framework is then covered by first, sheets of compressed fiberboard. Second, a layer of rock wool to provide insulation. And third, by corrugated sheet metal. The doors and windows are interchangeable. All roads to the air station like this one were built by manual labor. The swampy topsoil was scraped away, a bed of rock laid down, and a layer of coarse volcanic gravel, followed by a layer of fine gravel, resulted in a fairly good road. While the construction of quarters was underway, the members of the bomber squadron were not on patrol, dug and built 10 sandbag protected gun emplacements. The guns, 50 millimeter anti-aircraft pieces, were part of the bomber patrol's reserve equipment. The completed camp awaiting official inspection by Admiral Kaufman and his staff. Warm, well-lighted, and comfortable. The old galley and the new.
Joining the Naval Air Station in Skirifjord is a small, courageous unit of Norwegian flyers. Flying British-supplied, American-built Northrops, these heroic men, in fair weather or foul, managed to maintain a daily patrol. One 17-year-old lad is credited with sinking three Nazi submarines. For protection against storms or air attack, the flyers have cut out revetments in the shore bank. Planes are moved to and from the water by a homemade wheeling device fastened to the pontoons. On shore, this is fairly simple. In the icy waters, a grueling task. The Reykjavik Airport, a well-developed airfield for land-based planes on the island. In this camouflaged hangar, all planes are serviced and maintained. Besides the field at Reykjavik, there are four other land and sea bases. At Kaldardanes, a two-way, well-improved field capable of repairing and supplying all planes. At Hornafjord, a two-way land plane field with no supplies. At Buderary, an ice-free seaplane base with limited supplies. At Akureyri, an ice-free seaplane and land plane base. Pingbolavatn is a volcanic lake, ice-free and fog-free, which in an emergency can serve as a landing base for seaplanes. Plans call for a field to be developed at Keflavik and in other suitable areas throughout the island. But the principal burden of patrol rests on the Navy's PBYs, moored in Skirifjord. On January 13, 1942, a wind of intense velocity came crashing down on the island, leaving a path of destruction in its wake. The harbor was a churning maelstrom. Many cargo ships were beached, lighter vessels were blown ashore. The PBYs weren't spared. Because these ships were not of the amphibian class, and in the absence of preparation for such an unexpected hurricane, five of these much needed planes were sent to the bottom.
over, there was little left to salvage. Only one amphibian, secured ashore, withstood the gale. A few days later, amphibians arrived to replace the PBYs that were lost. This disaster will not occur again. Organized communication with Greenland and other meteorological stations has been established to give ample warning in the event of an approaching storm. Qualfjord, a sheltered retreat for all men of war of the Allied nations. Protected by lofty ice peaks, this deep fjord provides a haven for naval vessels of all classes while refueling and undergoing minor repair. The submarine and torpedo nets guard the entrance to the narrow mouth of the fjord. There is considerable controversy among authorities as to the wisdom of concentrating many warships here. It is argued that apart from being an easy target, it would be a difficult place to evacuate in an emergency. The USS Kearney, after being torpedoed, made for Qualfjord and was patched up by the Navy's Vulcan before returning to a Boston dry dock. Our camera crew, dispersed on many vessels of a convoy, proceeds toward Halifax. A PBY patrol plane operating from Iceland warns that an enemy submarine has been sighted in the vicinity. An alert is given. All hands to battle stations. From aboard a cruiser, scouting planes are catapulted into the air. A destroyer, taking direction from the scouting planes, drops its deadly ash cans and hits its mark. The signal to cease fire. In the wake of the cruiser, a smoke bomb is dropped. This indicates the direction of the wind and assists the scouting plane in landing in the turbulent waters. Perfect landing. Note how the pilot drops the hook in the tow net. Hoisting planes aboard while underway requires organized and coordinated teamwork. This crew seems to know its business. Convoy reforms and proceeds on its zigzag course. Again, a patrol plane appears overhead. This time it brings news that the British merchantman Wildebeest was torpedoed and sunk, and about 25 members of her crew are afloat in two lifeboats. The USS Lang says that she will go to their rescue, but will require refueling upon her return. The tanker Sapello agrees to stand by to supply the fuel. About two days later, after what seemed a hopeless search, the Lang returns with the survivors safely aboard. The refueling operations begin. A ticklish job when done under favorable sea conditions. This was particularly difficult because both vessels had to keep moving. 
These waters are sub-infested. The job was done in record time. 37,000 gallons of fuel oil for a crate of canned pineapple. Thank you, Sapello. Well done. Because of limited docking facilities and a lack of deep water piers capable of accommodating the larger ships, the discharge of cargo is delayed for weeks at a time. In many cases, ships are compelled to wait in the outer harbor as long as seven weeks, and in some instances, are ordered home fully laden. The area offers a highly vulnerable target for attack. Since the port at Reykjavik is the only port in Iceland, all supplies and materials must be distributed throughout the island by trucks traveling over spongy, unimproved, one-way winding roads and over narrow country bridges. The United States Army is laying better road beds and is widening and strengthening the bridges to permit the passage of heavier trucks and tanks. The ice-free fjords, Qualfjord and Ijafjord, if extensively developed, could serve as auxiliary ports. Added to this is the problem of the tide. During low tide, deep draft merchantmen like the Delta are obliged to leave the pier and await the return of high water. Many others are unloaded by tank lighters. This entire congests principal city. The airport. The city, the outer and inner harbors, guardian of the United Nations North Atlantic Lifeline. 1,800 air miles from Halifax, 825 miles from Scotland, and only 900 from Nazi-held Norway. To this sub-Arctic island during the summer of 1941 came the vanguard of an American expeditionary force. This film depicts Iceland as it looked between November 1941 and early spring 1942. Protected by a long spit of land, forming a natural breakwater, is the outer harbor of Reykjavik, Iceland.